Friends, if you are a fan of And That's Why We Drink, I mean, you better be because you're here, then we have a <laughs> podcast to share with you. It's one of our favorites, and we could not be more excited to be telling you about Jim Harold's Campfire. Um, Jim Harold's Campfire has been, I, I still say to this day, it was my number one inspiration for starting our own podcast. It was. It was it's a podcast on true stories of the supernatural. It's got ghosts. It's got UFOs. It's got cryptids. It's all the things that if you like my side of the podcast, you mm-hmm. are going to love Jim Harold's Campfire. Yeah. And the concept is pretty simple. So Jim talks to regular folks about strange stuff that happens to them. It's 90 minutes every week. I'm not kidding. It is one of the ones that I queue up as the first of the day every time it comes out. Um, Em and I have listened for years and we are huge fans of the show. We actually both have been on it years ago before we even started a podcast to share our stories. (laughs) Our very first try at being on a podcast. Our very first guest nervous. (laughs) Oh, gosh. And we've actually become like really good friends with him over the years. He's come to our live shows and jim harold is just like just the sweetest kindest person and it's just it's such a great podcast he's a paranormal podcasting icon he's been doing this for so long um it really is one of the early inspirations for our show we love it um it's very spooky it's there's not you know lots of music and effects it's basically people just telling their stories um like a campfire to speak for themselves and it's it's uh it's just a really cool concept and it's by far one of my favorite podcasts so do us both a favor and uh, follow or subscribe to Jim Harold's Campfire. It's one of our favorite podcasts. It truly is. It's just a delight. And you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also learn more about it um, at jimherald.com. You can also sub- probably submit your own story and mm-hmm. maybe f- get featured on there sometime. Yeah, let them know we say hi, please. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Hey, boozers and shakers, we are coming at you live. We're so excited for a fall tour. It'll be the final installment of our current Here for the Booze tour. The final, I think, 10 shows, something like that. But it's the the final countdown. uh, And we're very excited. But if you want a chance at ever seeing Here for the Booze one last time, this is it, folks, before we do our next big, big, big tour. So uh, hopefully you can make it to the next few cities. If you want to, you can check out uh, our tickets at and that's why we drink dot com slash live. We can't wait to see you there. Some shows are already sold out. So get on it quick. Bye. Hello, M. Hello, hello, <laughs> Christine. <laughs> With the just... upper inflections? Ooh, question mark. I was just saying to M that you know Eva had a doctor's appointment, couldn't be on the recording, um, and usually she runs the kind of behind the scenes stuff and uh, moderates, if you will. And I said it feels like our teacher left the class abruptly, and we have to like kind of fend for ourselves, Lord of the Flies style, like anarchy, you know. <laughs> I uh, did. Speaking of anarchy in a classroom, did your school ever do the thing on St. Patrick's Day? Where do you know where I'm going with this yet? No. Where in elementary school you would like go play, and he's clearly like asked another teacher to like ruin the classroom while you were gone, and when you would come back, he would say like, "Oh, a leprechaun got in." No. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? I I I was. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's what Eva's gonna come back and be like. What the hell happened? And we're gonna say a leprechaun got in. We don't know what happened to this podcast. It, it was, wasn't our fault. It was. Uh, it was like a thing. I thought maybe only at my school, but it, yeah, you would go out to play, and then on St. Patrick's Day, someone would come. The room would be ransacked when you that's got back. Horrifying. And well, did, did you like, have to clean it up? I don't remember. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's like a bad game. <laughs> but I no, it was a, also there was one time where I got pulled aside, which I felt so cool because like I was the student that was selected, not to be the leprechaun. This was another thing, um, but same we idea. Moved I on guess from the leprechaun. Okay. <laughs> um, well, the same teacher, my fourth grade teacher. Well, uh, I think you're getting the pattern here. Of, of, <laughs> he just <laughs> likes to fuck up his own room and then make us clean it up. Uh, he uh, pulled me aside. He was doing some sort of. In hindsight, I don't totally remember the lesson. I think it was like, like, be responsible when adults aren't around. Because he apparently did this every year. And everyone knew it was like, at least I knew it was coming. A few kids had told me about it that were older than me. Uh But I guess he did it every year. Where he would take one of the kids that I guess 
in, it makes me feel good because I think he would always pick a kid that like people seem to respect. And okay, relax. And uh, <laughs> I didn't like, say anything. And he would uh, like pull you aside and like hatch a plan that he was like going to be gone for fifteen minutes. And he well, okay. gave me he just needed a reason to be gone for fifteen minutes. <laughs> I, I don't know who he was sleeping with or smoking or. <laughs> He needed the potty, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But he uh, gave me full permission to just absolutely destroy his room. What? <laughs> he, it, the goal was to see if I could entice other kids to be ba- on bad behavior if he was gone. If I could trick them into... I don't know. And the I think le- this guy had to pick up a prescription at Walgreens and just wanted to. It does to feel weird as I explain it as an adult. You. But as a child, it was. I think the lesson was like, even if someone you respect is telling you that you should be bad in a room when you know to follow a moral compass, you should do it. Because then he would come in and be like, because I did. I successfully got the entire classroom to be fucking rowdy. Of course and you did. <laughs> it was a good time. Anyway, those are two stories about the exact same teacher who apparently has a, a problem. A, an interest in messy rooms. Or a rooms. secret life. I'm not really sure. I don't think the messy room was the point. I think the point was, <laughs> how easily can I distract these children while I go do something he did nefarious? It real well. Um. By the way, now your turn. You tell me about your substitute teachers and how they were actually probably responsible. <laughs> uh. Well, I don't know about that, but um. I feel like wow. I don't really have anything off the top of my head that um. That really uh, matches up to that. I will say, um, totally off the rails. And since we don't have somebody here to monitor what we're doing, oh yeah, um, I'm just gonna kind of throw a wrench into everything and change the subject. Oh, um, if what? that's okay with you, what's happening? This is your uh, your call, everybody. If you need a new spooky podcast, um, you should go listen to Jim Harold's Campfire. It's really good. Uh, it was the first podcast Em and I ever bonded over. I still listen to it every week and. Um, if you call in with your own story, tell them that we sent you because I love those little <laughs> shout outs and I make everyone in my family stop what they're doing and I disconnect my AirPods and I make them listen to the shout outs. I, so. I, I still say that he is absolutely the reason why I wanted to do a podcast. Yeah. So yeah it's I'm, true it's it's pretty it's pretty cool um also yeah we did we started recording pretty close to time today but then again every whenever eva's here we always have like a meeting together for exactly us. she has more important things to do like ask us about important things re- pertaining to our jobs uh-huh yeah and now so. she's not here so technically it's like a teacher work day yeah i can't i can't stop it with these like weird almost school puns are you okay like you just are like thinking about elementary school a lot that can't be healthy it can't be healthy and yet (laughs) and yet you won't stop okay Uh, you got it i I just i just won't um okay well other than that is there a reason why you drink what do you drink you know i'm drinking a deep peppy (gasps) because uh you know one of our mutual favorites which is rare to find a mutual taste that we both can agree on but we love a deep peppy the two of us Mm -hmm. and uh for those unacquainted that's a dr pepper for you um (laughs) for the squares yeah Yeah. the squares out there (laughs) uh but yeah i I was out of the uh, my iced coffee that i usually buy at the store like the and i didn't have time to go get some before we recorded so i'm drinking d peppy and i the reason i drink this week am is because i've been having nightmares again and it was a long time since i had like bad dreams but i keep having just creepy bad dreams that are like a little too realistic you know where they put me on edge all day i wasn't going to say anything i Uh actually (laughs) i i woke up today from i'm not kidding the absolute worst dream (gasps) i've ever had absolute worst are you serious top five if not top one are you serious? I'm not, I woke up in like full blown hyperventilating cream. <gasps> yeah. Oh no. It was a full bl- to be fair, it was a dream based on like m- my actual like world's biggest fear. Yeah. And so okay. but it was I just could not get it together. Like I could I even though I knew it was I had woken up and I was dreaming oh, just no, like Anne, then I, I had the like ref- I had the reflection of it and then I cried all over again. But it was like a like a inconsolable cry. It was okay really well crazy. i will say mine wasn't that bad at least last night but i've been having the same thing where i just keep waking up with like in panic and like sweat and like freaking out and and the dreams are all very eerie and creepy and like oh, i'm always so, going into some underground space it's very unsettling and it's always like the same 
place, which I don't interesting. like. Interesting. It's I interesting what our also I love how I found a way to like upstage you with like you had a bad dream and I went, I've been hyperventilating crying. <laughs> no. Sorry. No, um, no, no. But... I, I do I like I appreciate that we are both having bad dreams. It's creeping me out a little more. It is interesting what your version of a nightmare is and what mine is. Because I feel like I have creepy, eerie, ghost yeah. stuff, murder stuff all the time. Yeah, no, me too. But I feel like for whatever reason, for they come in phases. And like I'll have them every night for like weeks. And then I just won't remember them for a what? couple months. And then all of a sudden it'll be like, wham, bam, every night I'm in a creepy, you know, basement and... Do you have a go-to nightmare that like like a theme that you're familiar with? I used to have a lot of uh, stabbing dreams. Or Interesting. Or, I don't think I've had or, a stabbing dream. I or this is a trigger warning where I would have to m- dismember uh, <gasps> like dead animals or people that I did not kill, but they were dead, and they I was tasked by somebody to like dispose of the bot, like just gruesome and that was when i was a little, little kid it's not like oh i'd read a lot of true crime and that's why it's just a reoccurring hmm. uh, creepy I... thing that ha- but also you know just the classics uh people <laughs> i love dying etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah 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 wow i have not had a dismembering experience um, one of the most horrific dreams i ever had i was probably 12 and i dreamt that there was a huge horse in my room and it died and i had to dismember it well it makes sense if you were little like you couldn't drag a whole horse you'd have to do it in chunks yeah, it makes perfect sense they said oh we murdered this horse now you have to dismember it and bury it in the yard yeah it made perfect sense you're right <laughs> i'm just saying i i'm just trying to defend that you probably didn't want to but in terms of efficiency I didn't want to. you're right uh um, yeah hmm. to be fair my teacher said i have to leave for 15 minutes um what happens here <laughs> is none of my business <laughs> was your teacher like the fucking godfather satan <laughs> yeah the godfather yeah maybe that's what was happening i needed the head for something he needed the head for something <laughs> right uh yeah no i've never i've never had that kind of stuff but i uh, very regularly i'd say at least once a week have a dream where i have committed a crime and yeah. i'm on the run what is that about i that, i don't that's, know I've... that's interesting i wonder if that's part of our psyche yeah, what am I guilty of? I don't know. Well, don't get me started. I, I mean, I truly don't. I, th- I mean, I've told you also one of my bigger fears is like just like ending up in jail and like for no reason. Like, yeah, the stories you tell about like people being <gasps> it's horrible. Innoc- innocent and incarcerated is just like a, a, such a, like a real dream, like nightmare come true. So yeah. a real dream come true. For me. Yeah, yeah. Yikes. Uh, no, but it's I think when I, it always seems to happen around the times when you tell stories like that, actually. So well, maybe that makes a it. little bit of sense. I think maybe that adds up pretty smoothly. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. I don't I don't have a reason um, or I don't have a, a thing that I drink. I forgot a drink outside. But in honor of your D Peppy, uh, I wanted to know if how many of the 23 flavors that make D Peppy do you know? Zero. I mean, zero. Uh you can't even, it's 23 flavors. You can't venture Coca-Cola, a little tasty, a little tasty, bubbly, Coca-Cola <laughs> bubbly. Cola is one of them. Uh, okay, I'm on to it. Uh-huh. Bubbly, syrupy. No. <laughs> There's a lot of flav- like tasty. flavors. Like think of like pumps at a coffee shop maybe. Like what cardamom. are those flavors? Uh cardamom's one? No way. Good for yeah. me. Yeah. Okay, I like that mine are bubbly cardamom and <laughs> <Coke>. <laughs> tasty. <laughs> uh, uh you want me to go, you want me to do it for you? Pepper. Uh, no. Well, that's cheating. The name it's in the name. You're you right. Can't call oh it no, that. pepper. Pepper is it? Pepper is okay, one. Pepper I got one. really upset for a minute there. Interesting. It could have been Doctor Cardamom pr- Prickly or whatever you just said. Yeah, <laughs> Doctor Bubbly. That's Dr. my new <laughs> beverage. It's called Doctor Bubbly. Doctor Cardamom. Okay, no, it is the twenty three R Cola. Tell me if you can taste these as okay. I go down. Cola. Mm-hmm. Cherry. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's why I like it. I love cherry flavor. Licorice. Yum. You don't like that. Uh, amaretto. Ooh, fancy. Almond. Okay. Isn't that Vanil- the same? No? Okay. Vanilla. Uh-huh. Blackberry. Okay, so this is every flavor. Apricot. Blackberry. Oh, you wait, the blackberry already. twice. Maybe it was blueberry. Blackberry. Blackberry's twice for some reason. Caramel, <sighs> pepper, anise. Is that how you say it? Uh, anise? Anise. Anise. Or anise? I don't know. Uh, sarsaparilla, ginger, molasses, 
plum, orange, nutmeg, cardamom, allspice, coriander, juniper, birch, prickly ash, and lemon. Of course. <laughs> that's last. <laughs> I, that's a lot of... Situations. That's an aggressive amount of flavors. I feel um, like we can pull back on one of them and no one would notice. I feel like uh, that's probably true and I imagine it's cardamom because I still don't totally understand where that came out of my... Uh, I'm on the prickly ash. That prickly really ash seems a little much. That's me off. You know? Yeah. Uh, anyway, also, well, there... Also, licorice what? and anise flavor are like the same thing. So I, I feel like they're stretching. Also, Coke and cherry, couldn't we just start out hot with a cherry Coke and then it's 22 flavors? Well, then that's a trademark that they probably have to pay for. I guess so, but isn't it owned by Coca-Cola? Don't they already have access to that? I don't think they have access to cola. Uh, oh, 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 I see. Because see. cola, I think, is just a more generic flavor. Wow, capitalism really hit me in the face. I thought cola was just owned by Coke for a second. Uh, listen, as your Uh-oh. resident non-conforming cap- non-capitalist, I can tell you, Coke doesn't own everything. Em. You might yeah. believe it does. I, I think I'm right often, though. Yeah, about actually, that. I said that out loud and went, actually, I don't think that's true. Uh, okay. That's true. Well, I'm here to tell you a story. I don't know if you'll remember my promise to you last week on what yes. we were going to be covering. Uh, uh, it's a house. It's a castle. It's a castle. My bad. That ZB calls Manresa Castle. I can't wait. Um, and I covered a little bit of it last time, but uh, this is the unabridged version. Okay. Okay. Also, it I double checked. It is on page two fifty five of it, a haunted road atlas. If you own that, oh, so check it out. I thought about doing a uh, reading an ep- excerpt, but th- I mean this the book is a really condensed version of what I'm about to tell you, and I feel like I already did that last week. So yeah. Also, they gotta pay for that if they want to read it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> paywall, paywall. Okay, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Speaking of capitalism, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We should do that thing sometime. We'll do a read-along and then we can have like the little Mickey Mouse bounce <gasps> along the words so that they, oh. people can follow along. I know I've said this before and I promise you I would someday learn how to do that and I have yet to learn. So maybe maybe this is the time. I feel like the way that your brain works, only you would know how to do that. And it, <laughs> but it, I want it to be a planchette, you know, that bounces <laughs> along so you can read as It's going to be a lemon and we both know it. So yeah. shut up. <laughs> Fine, it's a lemon planchette. I feel like only you and the original creator of that abil- that skill on the television are the only two people on Earth He's who like, can figure it out. like, how did you learn my secret? I'm like, I drink a lot of deep peppy and stayed up till six in the morning. <laughs> okay, uh, here we are with Manresa Castle. Uh, so it starts in 1856 when Charles Eisenbeis, he immigrates to New York from Prussia. And he mm-hmm. moved west for the gold rush uh, with his brother, and they both settle in Port Townsend, which we talked about in the last episode. Yes. So they settle in Port Townsend, and he had already been making some money in New York as a baker. And so him and his brother, moving to the, the West Coast, they were like, okay, well, let's open up a bakery together. Um, and they call it Pioneer Bakery. And Cute. they make... I know. And they make bread and crackers for supply stock for sailors who are coming through. Okay. So not my favorite name, but... I, I like the concept. Is that a bad name? Yeah, I, I just the word pioneer. I just associate with <laughs> yeah colonial yeah, yeah. I, uh, moments. I suppose. Yeah, that's a fair assessment. I think it's a cute name, but I can see where it would get um, some flack. It's one of those names where, like, if it didn't have such a gross uh, context to it, it like almost would sound nice. There's a, there's like a TikTok I've seen where in the comments it's like leave your favorite name if it didn't actually mean what it meant and it's like just the like calorie like it's, it's like it all Wait, of a sudden does... leave your favorite hold on say it again leave, leave your favorite sound like your favorite what would be name if it didn't mean something else already so like someone like the sound of calorie but it that oh, means a calorie wow this is a deep cut trend I, is it a okay. deep cut uh, my, maybe not maybe I'm my just algorithm old. is full of it where i i feel like i'm always seeing people's like random words that they would turn into names is pioneer a bad thing i guess i guess in my mind pioneer is more just like oh we just kind of live off the land and like go west but i guess the idea is that typically they're 
quote unquote discovering places is that the kind of I don't think the word pioneer is inherently bad because I do think there the are pioneer woman cookbook. Is that bad or like that's that's where do I... a bestseller. That one's fine. <laughs> that one's good. We're OK. It's successful. No. Speaking of capitalism, it's successful in that we can't touch it. Yeah, you know? I think the word itself probably isn't that bad. I just get a little grossed out at anything that reminds me of that time period. And the word pioneer I associate with you know, definitely t- like colonizing that. that kind of thing. Yeah. It's not. It's not good. You're right. You're completely right. I, I hadn't even put that together, but thank you for educating me. Oh, I don't, for all I know, I'm being uber sensitive, but it's just for me, every time I hear that word, I'm like, mm, where's the rest of the sentence going? <laughs> yeah, so. you're right. I, I, I feel like that about that word because it's a cool word. And I think Pioneer Bakery, what's it called? Pioneer, Pioneer bakery? bakery. Like it's such a cute name, but yeah, I guess if it's, yeah, it's not a great connotation. Anyway, sorry. I know we're probably irritating a lot of people, but I an abundance of caution. <laughs> well, okay, so they open Pioneer Bakery. They're making bread for ships that come in. Mm-hmm. And Charles becomes very wealthy doing this. He becomes an entrepreneur and he's working in real estate. He's uh, involved in building banks and storefronts for the area. He helps um, invest into properties like a hotel, a brewery, a bakery. He's also in charge of like a, a lumber yard and a brickyard. So he's just kind of doing it all. Nice. Um, in fact, he's so successful. And I guess Port Townsend was so small at the time that. I'm assuming there wasn't too much competition, so it was easy for him to climb the the ladder. Yeah, um, he was elected as Port Townsend's first mayor, and he served three terms. Mm-hmm. And he was also part of the Big Five Syndicate, which was Port Townsend's like five most powerful men, essentially, who ran the economy more or less. Wow. I tried looking up the names of the other big five but i didn't recognize any of them i was hoping for like a fun fact like did you know snoop dog was one of them or, you know? <laughs> yes i did actually <laughs> he, he does everything <laughs> so in 1865 uh charles marries or he is married to a wife named elizabeth and then she dies and we never really hear about her again um as a living character or as a ghost but um so he marries Elizabeth, she dies, and then he marries Kate, who is like Kate Eisenbeis and is kind of the wife of the story. Okay, she's the lady in white. She is she is potentially a lady in white, yes. Oh, okay. Um, in 1892, um, when he's very settled in Port Townsend and he's doing all these big um, business deals, I guess, in town, in 1892, he plans, or he ends up building this hotel which was one of the properties I mentioned because Mm -hmm. uh, the town had said that a railroad was going to be built soon. And so he was trying to get ahead and he built a hotel for visitors that would be coming in. And then the railroad plan never went through and he had built a whole fucking 120 room hotel (gasps) for a place that is now not going to have a lot of tourists. That's rough. So one source said that this hotel burned down in a mysterious fire and then I heard nothing about that ever again. While other sources said that now that this hotel was vacant and he'd already put so much money into it, he turned it into his own home. Oh, oh, interesting. Kind of like a, I always wanted my move. I wanted my own castle anyway, kind of thing. (laughs) It's all for me then more for me. I guess so. If if he's putting all of his money into it, he technically does. It would be an easy fix to just move in. Right. Yeah. So he renovated it into his dream home. It became, it was supposed to be called hotel Eisenbeis. And then he just turned it into the Eisenbeis castle. Wow. Um, it looked, I guess, similar to the castles from his homeland in Prussia. And so that was, he. I think he built it originally to look like part of his homeland as an homage. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden he just had his own fucking Prussian castle. I mean, listen, it's just sometimes that's what but, you got to do. There have been bigger problems in the world, I think. So <laughs> <It's> certainly bigger <laughs> problems. So Eisenbeis castle, it was... Third, he ended up turning it into three stories. It had 30 rooms, like bedrooms. It had four separate heating systems. The walls were 12 inches thick of actual bricks from his brickyard because he also had a brickyard. Oh, sure. The castle is 25,000 bricks accumulatively. Wow. And it was the obviously biggest residence in the city. Wow. Not even 20 years later, it's 1902, and Charles Eisenbeis uh, has Bright's disease, which is like a chronic kidney disease. Oh, no. And so he dies from that, and we get a little drama from it, um, because 
his casket was put in a vault near, if you're familiar with the area, Laurel Grove Cemetery. Um, he's put into a vault and he is placed next to his first wife, Elizabeth. Mm. Which, like, I wonder how his living second wife felt mm, about that. Yeah, that's kind of rough. Um, Elizabeth was in a Victorian glass top coffin, material girl. <laughs> and <laughs> the vault was sealed for many years but then at some point a part of the vault cracked and fell in uh, fell Yay. onto their coffins and so they had to open everything up for repairs oh boy and this slab that fell into their space it landed on elizabeth's coffin and broke the glass no as well as another coffin that was not supposed to be there and it was another victorian glass top child-sized coffin <gasps> what yep the fuck is going on and it was sitting on top of charles casket so there's charles casket and a little child one on top next what? to his wife and so it almost looked like there was a whole family buried together but the managers of the graveyard n never had any record of someone opening up the vaults again to put a child oh casket in there what they ended up asking the family, like, did someone sneak in and do this? Like, how? what happened? And the family had no idea <gasps> that it had happened or who this child-sized casket was. Like, it could for all we know, it could have been just a random person who buried a casket on top of them. But you'd have to, like, open up a whole-ass vault. Yeah, that seems... And especially for such an expensive casket. Like, yeah. it seems like this is a very particular type of casket they've got going. It's a weird one. So we don't know who this little kid we is still to this day. <gasps> Oh my god, how weird is that? It's funky fresh. Ooh, it's it's very odd. Um and in night so okay, so in 1902 he died. He's that whole thing happens. And his uh second wife Kate, Kate Eisenbeis, she remarries and leaves the castle for 20 years. It's still I guess technically in their name, but she leaves it to a caretaker and other than okay. that it's abandoned. So in the 1920s, while it's abandoned and in theory a caretaker lives there, a woman traveling through also named Kate. Mm. She uh, stays here. I, potentially she's like friends with the caretaker or something to be able to get yeah. in here. Um, and this is homegirl Kate who had the tropiest of tropey deaths where she was oh, waiting for her. Oh, that's the Kate. I was thinking it was the other Kate. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's waiting for her lover to return from war or return from sea or return from the grocery store. <laughs> and she... <laughs> had heard whispers that he did not make it and wasn't going to come home Ugh. and so she ends up jumping out of the window of what is now room 306 oh boy however to everyone's surprise yes uh he survived and he comes to find her survived his grocery store debacle <laughs> came he figured home. it out honey i'm home oh no and uh finds out that she's dead jumped out of the window he comes back and that's allegedly it. Then uh, after that was 1921. And another version says that she thought he was uh, she thought she was pregnant and had been sleeping with someone else. And then when he comes back, she can't face him. So she jumps out the window. And there's a bunch of different versions of like why she right. why she jumps. Oh, and to this day, her picture now hangs in the castle, which I'm kind of confused. But, like, this is another reason why it's very very likely to be a legend because why would this random woman named kate who was passing through but not the actual kate eisenbys who lived there yeah and also why was she there waiting for her love to come home from sea if she was just passing through town it's just a strange it's a strange story yeah yeah, yeah. i it really it's not clicking it's and then not they, clicking. they were like oh now let's paint her portrait yeah, I don't get it's it. It's weird. Okay. So in 1925, uh, the house finally sells to somebody else and it becomes a vacation home for nuns. That <laughs> a vacation home for nuns? And guess what? It didn't get used a lot. <laughs> are you are you sure it's not a vocation? <laughs> like a vocation? It says vacation? It said vacation. I mean, I believe it. I just, I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, and in 1920, I thought it was going to be vocation too, but like three different websites, unless they're all copy and pasting the same text and they are no, using I, the same listen, typo. I'm not doubting you at all. I just, I'm, 
I'm, I'm into this vacation home for nuns idea. I really would like to know what so that the reality looks like. show in the making. I would like to know what it looked like, but I, I got nothing. I, mm. I, you'd think it's got to be a typo, right? Because I feel like if it said vacation, someone would have felt the need to list what makes it a vacation home. I guess. I also I don't, don't know. know what a vocation home is. So, I mean, I could be totally making that up, too. I don't All know. right. Maybe it's a little bit of <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it doesn't get used a lot, probably because nuns are busy. And <laughs> then two years later, uh, Jesuit priests bought the building uh, and decided that they were going to use it as a monastery for ministry students. Uh, and I think it was only ministry students in their like last year of studying. Ugh, thanks, priests. We had a nice vacation home on our hands, and now it's the odd study in there. And they're like, you know what? You're Classic. not using it, so we're going to take advantage <sighs> of it. Fine. The castle was renamed Manresa Hall, and it was, a, 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 there were different sources. The one I'm going to go with is that it was in honor of where St. Ignatius Loyola was born. Ignatius. But other, Ignatius, thank you. Uh, in honor of where St. Ignatius Loyola was born. Or okay. it was named after where the actual order was founded. Um, mm. But the most of them said where um, St. Loyola was born. Okay. While it was a monastery, the Jesuits put in a $3,500 elevator, which is now over fifty grand today. Uh, they put Jeez. in a whole new addition to the building so they could fit a chapel. They added bedrooms, and apparently they added 43 bathrooms. What? Whoa. I don't know. Why? I guess they added 4D because there were already three. Today there are 43 bathrooms after the Jesuits were there. That seems excessive, doesn't it? How many rooms are there? <laughs> Not 43, I don't think. I thought there were 30. <laughs> he made 30 bedrooms. I feel like if you look at like Zillow, like a 30 bed, 43 bath would seem proportional to each other. I guess. I guess. I, I don't know, homie. It makes no sense to me. Okay. Uh, so there is a, the, the story that happens while it was a monastery is that one of the priests in training was hooking up with a nun who I guess was on vacation or something for them to both be there. Uh, and they ended up getting caught and oh, no. he was later found in the attic hanging from the rafters <gasps> above, oh, no. above what is now room 302. Oh. But there is no record. There's no official record of a, a student dying by suicide there, but it also could have very easily been kept quiet because i was gonna say but i don't know if they're very open typically with their kind of scandals let's say yeah. in the catholic church well because suicide's a cardinal sin too yeah yes, so they exactly. definitely probably didn't want to have that out so that's what a convenient cover-up if this is a legend right They're like oh well of course there's no official documentation mm -hmm. of it interesting there is one official death of a priest nearby named father john murphy who is said to have drowned nearby or oh, no. near the property. Um, but we don't ever talk about him. We only ever focus on Kate and the student who hang himself. I guess those are more dramatic backstories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so whatever. Of course, the one actual potentially the documented, one documented death. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Uh, so in 1968, the they end up selling the building again, and then it becomes a hotel. And the owners changed the name because it was once Eisenbach's castle and then Manresa Hall. Now they're calling it the Manresa Castle so they can take two parts, parts oh, of the original names and combine cute. it. That's cute. And I was actually thinking earlier when you said, oh, he called it, he was going to call it Eisenbach's Hotel and then he changed it to Castle. I was like, honestly, Castle is a cooler name for a hotel anyway. Right? So right. I'm glad they kind of stuck with that. I am too. I I would much rather, as a tourist, want to stay in a castle than a Absolutely. hotel. Absolutely, a Prussian castle. I mean, come on. <laughs> and so, since uh, since it's become a hotel, it has been owned by at least three different owners who have all done different versions of renovations, but they've all kept it pretty OG. And it has like a restaurant in it, a lounge in it, an event space in it, and that is the history. But now onto the ghosts. Mm. Um, so. One general manager who was basically confirming that the stories of Kate and the, the student priest was confirming that they are not true. Uh, the general manager said that a bartender years ago named Nick, he invented both of the stories because so many tourists were coming in saying, this place looks haunted. Is it haunted? Is it haunted? Oh. And so eventually he was like, oh, yeah, here, sure. here are two stories. 
And the general manager said that he okayed the stories as long as the stories were allegedly from the two most expensive rooms so that they would sell better. (laughs) Okay, now we're talking. Uh, That being said, and a bunch of other people who work there have said that the legends are bogus, but that does not take away from the fact that many staff confirm that whatever the origins of the story is or whatever the untold stories of the Mm. real spirits there, uh, a lot of people experience really creepy stuff. So interestingly, the rooms 302 and 306, where both of the legends happened, they are said to be the most haunted rooms and also apparently room 304. And I guess that's just it's between the two of them. It's just stuck in the middle. 304 is like, I didn't do anything. I'm Um, sorry. It's not my fault. But it's interesting, uh, like mind over matter of like, oh, if those stories really didn't happen, how come those two rooms are the most haunted? And it's maybe because yes. so many people put their energy into that space. Yes. They're just like creating it. Create your own yeah. reality, you know? So room 306 is where Kate died. And people still say that they see an apparition of her. She has long, dark hair. She's in a white gown. So of course she's the lady in white. Mm. Um, I've also seen that she could be the lady in blue, but the overarching theme is that she's in white because they all fucking are. Yeah. Um, She's often seen near the window that she allegedly jumped from. And she is seen sitting on the guest beds of people while they're sleeping. Nah, I don't love that. Just wake up to someone staring at you. You've been there. Nothing. Yeah, I have. And I don't know if it was better or worse than a woman in a Victorian dress. I think it was probably worse because it was um, a man, a creepy man <laughs> without a shirt on. So I guess uh, I forgot he didn't have a shirt on. He had like an undershirt, like a um, yeah, I kept the tank top. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I um, did I tell you somebody on Twitter and I wish I had the name off the top of my head tagged me or tagged me and then said, oh, and tagged Knoxville ghost hunters or whatever and said like can you look into this what was this building before because like i said it was a pretty brand new hotel but like in an old part of town and then the i was like oh cool and i liked it and then the user the initial person who tagged both of us said that they went and did some digging and found out it used to be like an old newspaper uh like the knoxville press or the knoxville Hmm. times or something and they were like, look through the photos. And in one of the photos, there was a dude in like a white tank top. And I was like, Ooh. I don't like the, who used to work there. And I was like, I don't love that. So anyway. can you imagine still being stuck at work? Oh, no, you're right. That would suck. Well, so back to Kate, because we were talking about last time how she was pretty messy. She might actually be the leprechaun because she will move your stuff around. She'll <laughs> oh, leave no. the drawers open. Uh, she likes to cause a scene. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also heard singing in the bathroom in the middle of the night. And Great. here's actually just a journal entry from one of the guests after they heard her singing in the middle of the night mm-hmm. while they were sleeping and got like woken that. up. And not only is it annoying, like, oh, I'm waking up because I'm hearing someone sleeping, but it's in your bathroom. Like, singing, that you not sleeping, right? Sorry. No, I, I I imagine that not only is it annoying because you're trying to sleep and they're yes, singing and right. bo- bothering you. But now on top of it, like in your locked safe space, there's someone in the bathroom. Yeah, it's and it's Ugh. it's that it's, I feel like it's that also that weird trope of um, things that aren't supposed to be creepy suddenly becoming way creepier when it's mm-hmm. like a ha- like someone be singing like a happy tune is so sinister. Yeah. <laughs> in that oh, context. 100 percent. Forget it. So here's a journal entry of someone waking up to her singing in the bathroom. I got up to go to the bathroom and see who was in there. And then the door eerily came open. There was a swish of cold air and a glowing light. And then all the lights came on by themselves. After that, we saw nothing else. In the 1970s, in the same room, a housekeeper, I mentioned this last time, but the housekeeper sat his keys on the table. And when he turned back, he saw them floating two feet in the air and then crash (laughs) down on the table as if they had been caught. I remember that. In uh, room 310, interesting, but still the third floor, which seems to be the most haunted floor, Mm. at least. Uh, In room 310, the desk manager named Jody and a maid were both uh, making a bed. And they saw an apparition walk through the halls. And they knew it was an apparition because it was someone walking through the halls when the hotel was completely vacant and closed and no one should be in there. She was in period clothing, and they could see the fire escape through her. Forget it. And when they go out to talk to her to be like, hey, who are you? She's disappeared. Hey, go talk to that woman who you can see the fire escape through her entire body. <laughs> uh, just see what she's doing here. You know, just check in. 
Yeah, it's not at all threatening that she clearly doesn't have insides. Yeah, like, oh, she's transparent, but, like, she's also trespassing. So can you <laughs> get her off the property? People also regularly hear footsteps in the attic, especially above through uh, 302, which is where the uh, student uh, died by suicide. And the whole, like I said, the whole third floor is allegedly haunted. People also hear voices here. They often hear the phrase help or help her. Oh, oh, that's sad. In the dining room, the apparition of Kate Eisenbys is said Mm. to show up in a long Victorian gown. And people also see a sad violinist. Okay. 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 Uh, Also, keep in mind, the dining room is the old chapel. And so because it's become somewhat of an event space or a party Uh. drinking room, they think that the people that were from the monastery that often were in this part of the room don't like that it is now a party space. Yeah, I can see why that would grind their gears a bit. A lot of times people will hear um, like chanting at night as if like it's still a chapel. But because they think that they're unpleased with why people use the space now. A lot of people have said that glasses will explode in their hands. They will turn upside down on tables. And when you look back, they're a, on a, they're in a different position. I don't like uh, that. That's they very will poltergeisty to me. Throw themselves off the table. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, pictures apparently will throw themselves off the walls. And there has been writing on mirrors like, get out. Okay. People also hear moaning, they hear knocking, they hear um, tapping nearby them. People have felt something petting their back. The doors will open and close by themselves. The TVs and lights will turn themselves on and off. And people often feel bursts of freezing cold air in the hallways. Mm. Um, Staff also feel constantly stared at and they have gotten EVPs of a man saying, I am not here. And EVPs of a German woman who says quite a lot. So, um, oh, oh, sorry, that was me. I was just passing through, <laughs> waiting for my lover to come home from the grocery store, and I well, just had yeah. a few things to say. They think it's probably Kate Eisenbeis because she was, I think she was Prussian, or it might be Elizabeth. It was one of the wives. Oh, oh, Elizabeth. Yeah, we never hear about her. Maybe that's her. She's trying to tell you all about that coffin that is sitting yeah, out. Yeah, she's like her. somebody put their other little coffin in there. <laughs> Uh, this one is not a personal favorite for what this person had to experience, but in terms of spook factor, yeah. uh, there's a housekeeper named Mardella who was working in the laundry room and saw a small handprint, uh, like as a bruise on her leg. All of a sudden oh. she had a bruise, looked like a little kid's handprint. And she knew that this place was haunted. And when she saw that, she was like, I don't like that they're touching me. So she said out loud to the ghosts to leave her alone. And then she got fucking sucker punched in the face. I <gasps> nothing. I nothing. I don't like that at first it was a kid's handprint and then it was like, but watch this. Oh. Yeah. Was it like just supposed to be small to be less threatening or was it or was it two yeah. different entities? Yeah. Ooh. I don't know. I hate also, it. Also, like I hate that because also they, they tell you, you know, if you set boundaries, they, mm-hmm. oh Jesus, sorry. My window's open and I have not had it open all year and the door just like started to swing open because oh, of the wind. F- bye. Bye. Um, no, but they tell you if you set those kind of boundaries out loud, that ghost will like leave you alone. And uh, clearly, this is not one of those examples. Oi. Well, yeah, apparently at Manresa Castle, <laughs> you should not be. Don't expect to be like. Don't expect your, your boundaries to be met by toxic spirits. <laughs> um, also, here, apparently, investigators have used a Ouija board. And they were talking to a man who had allegedly died by suicide. And all the responses they got were Bible verses. Oh, that is creepy. That one I cannot get behind, simply. Mm. Um, It also makes you wonder, like, the uh, trustability. That can't be the right word. But the... (laughs) the, um, the tr- I, it it makes you wonder how effective a Ouija board really is, or if people are just going in there and messing with it on their own. Because if it's really a legend and this guy didn't die there, why are Bible verses showing up on the Ouija board? Great question. But who on this ghost team knows so much about Bible verses that they can just like call them up on a whim? I guess so, but I would argue that a lot of people that are in the ghost world are people who have deconstructed their faith. Yeah, but like I, I don't know if I'd be able to. Like you'd have to really know your 
Bible to like be able maybe. to just call. I mean, I I don't know. Maybe it just said Luke and then a bunch of numbers. I don't oh. know. But I feel like <laughs> if maybe... it said like specific numbers and then it like correlated to the Bible, I feel like that's a very niche. What if maybe someone on the investigative team wasn't telling everyone that they were training to be an exorcist because that would require uh, knowledge of that, you know? Yeah. They were like, these are just the ones I'm learning in class right now. Yeah, but you don't know that. You don't know that. But we don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's still creepy no matter what. Um, there was one uh, ghost hunting team called the Olympic Paranormal. No, the Olympic Peninsula Paranormal Society. And in 2010, they got 51 EVPs in one investigation here. Oh, my God. Uh also, like I said earlier, there are journal entries and pictures that have been kept by the staff to show people. And at one point, they would just sit in guest rooms, but then it freaked the guests out so much that they had to get removed from the rooms. I think they still have a hold of them like behind the desk, though, so you can still ask about it. Mm. And this is one of the guest entries. Our son James went down to use the restroom down the hall. Uh, it was the room 303 bathroom. And came back concerned that he heard a woman crying mournfully in the bathroom next door, but the lights went, but the lights were out in that room. So basically nobody should have been in there because the bathroom was dark. He brought his dad down to the hall to show him. And he also heard the crying. Mm -hmm. I then went down there, but by the time I got there, she was no longer crying. I did, however, hear movement coming from inside the room. When I knocked on the door and asked if somebody needed help, the response was too knocks back for whoever was in there at the at that point we decided to call the front desk to tell them what was going on they sent up four maids to check the situation out and when they opened the door it was dark inside and no one was there but the maid commented that someone had been into the kleenex because it was strewn all about <gasps> oh oh i just got goose cam hate it oh i got goose cam oh that moment where they turn to you and they're like but there's kleenex everywhere and you're like oh it's like so you definitely heard all the crying Ooh. oh that's horrible they should oh you know i wonder too because kleenex <laughs> tissues are so light i wonder if it's just easy to manipulate oh, yeah. you know as a spirit i don't know if that's a stretch but it seems like uh it would be easy to kind of throw about Speaking of stretches, part of me thought like, oh, maybe it was like fake crying just for the attention or something like to get like <laughs> that a, would be what we think <laughs> just to make people hear the sound of like, Woo -ha! and it's like just actually having a party throwing tissues around. I don't know. <laughs> like I needed an excuse to play with this tissue box. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another journal entry here uh, that says finally around 1130 at night, we heard we started hearing things. Earlier, we were looking forward to hearing things, but when we actually did hear things, we were huddled with the blankets to our noses. Ain't that there... the way it goes? You're like, I want to see a ghost. And then all of a sudden, you're like, I'd rather do anything but <laughs> see a ghost right now. That's exactly how I feel mm -hmm. all the time. I'm like, ooh, yep. spooky. And I'm like, oh, my God. Never oh my mind. God. No. <laughs> there wasn't really anything in the room. It was in the hallway. Definite dragging and walking sounds. Ugh. They would stop right at the door. It was ooh. so scary. Then scratching and scraping sounds at the door. It was like someone was right on the other side and would open or come through the door this all went on for about an hour and a half gross i hate it for sure you'd be like paralyzed with fear in there like is somebody outside the door oh can for they get 90 in? minutes you're just like am i safe Ugh. yeah no by the way i don't think so well so uh the manresa castle has been featured on our favorite ga ghost adventures mm. uh it's also been featured on haunted history and also my ghost oh my ghost story okay and this location has participated, at least in 2018's World's Largest Ghost Hunt. So I looked into World's Largest Ghost of Hunt. Of course. And uh, it did participate in 2018. I don't think it's participated since. But it happens every year on September 24th, which is National Ghost Hunting Day. And five days away, baby. Five days away. As and this we record. This year will be the seventh anniversary of the World's Largest Ghost Hunt. And it looks like it's... Not the that everyone, um, I guess it, it's not like everyone comes to one location to go sun together, which I was curious about because I was like, if there's like 300 people who won't shut up in a house, like how on earth is this <laughs> and quality you know ghost hunting? Someone is whispering and trying to make it seem like there's oh, a yeah. ghost and like tugging on people's clothes just to fuck with them. So instead, it's the concept of globally all the ghost hunters go out that day and ghost hunt okay. at a haunted location. I actually know about this because when I moved to Cincinnati or Kentucky, I went up to um, the like local 
like crystal shop, you know, and I walked in there and there were all these cats and I was like, I like it here. And I was walking around and I was talking to the guy up front and he gave me like a flyer about the local paranormal society. And he's like, oh, have you ever participated in National Ghost Hunting Day? And I was like, what? And I think I immediately sent you a picture of the business card and said like, what is National Ghost Hunting Day? And <laughs> we had never heard of it. And he said that they, like, are the local ghost hunting group uh, participates in it every year. So I don't know where they go, but we need to start figuring stuff. out locations near us and do it together. That would yeah, be fun. I think that would be fun. Um, I wonder if that, I mean, this might just be a stretch again, but I wonder if, like, so many people are doing it at once, if it, like, raises the ghostly vibration you know what i mean yeah i would imagine it does the opposite it makes it like much less scary and spooky and like you're less connected to things oh you think i don't know i don't know i or wonder what if, if they... the spirits what if it's like a thinning of the veil like on day of the dead where it's like well oh. they know that we're all trying to communicate so maybe this is the time that they all step forward you know so smart yeah maybe i, I wonder know. maybe they should have participating locations that are like certain tiers where it's like if you want to fuck around like go to this one and if you <laughs> If you are trying to like, like really do the it, the elite like go to, tier, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so each participating location, because it's not just go ghost hunting at any location. They people have to like sign up and like be cool with people showing up to their location. Each participating location also is asked to offer a live stream, so that way people can see it from wherever they are, and they can. It's just How more cool. eyes and ears on it to see if they spot anything. I love and that. There are two goals of uh, World's Largest Ghost Hunt. One is to preserve historical properties and to educate people on the historic locations that are out there. And the second goal is to explore cultural diversity influences within ghost hunting. Wow. So it's educating people on different beliefs and ways of working with the supernatural. Um, and I guess like a side quest of that is getting to see how different methods of ghost hunting all work at the same time. So a quote from the website is what will be the difference between a seance in a Victorian parlor in Australia versus a Ouija board session in a jail in mystical Ireland. And it's all happening at one time. Wow. So you can see. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that I was pretty think cool. That's really cool. Um, so fun fact that is it's coming out in seven days or five days for Too us. Too bad when this comes out, it'll be over. <laughs> so, but next year, everybody. I will say one of the places that seems to be a regular participant, um, I think it's in Tennessee, is the Carton Palace. I've never heard of it. So here's the problem with the website for National... Because you can go to nationalghosthuntingday.com and it'll show you like world's largest ghost hunt. But there's a lot of... Um, like password protected section. So like I'm trying to click on locations right now and it's saying like, you can't visit this page. <laughs> so I'm like, well, okay. that doesn't help anybody. But um, yeah, if you want to sign up, I'm sure that you can, I'm sure there's someone out there who knows a lot more information than I do on this. So well, if you are I'm interested, immediately go for it. on the uh, ticket site and I have uh, quite a few lo uh, locations here. We oh, have good. Okay. the Lep Castle in Ireland, which you've covered, I believe. Mm hmm. Uh, Ancient Ram Inn in yes. England. You've That's done that. one of the scariest ones that I've covered. Oh, I, I vaguely remember. Uh, Tilly Pierce House in Gettysburg. Uh, Bran Castle, Dracula's Castle in Romania. Oh. Wow. Uh, Waverly Hills, that's very close to me, Em. It's like an hour away. Come mm. on. Uh, Skirid Mountain Inn in Wales, UK. And the Ohio State Reformatory, an hour in the other direction. So, Oh, my God. And then the Conjuring House as well. So we got a lot of options. Um, nice. We should have uh, tag teamed I know. The, the Waverly Hills and Mansfield. Damn. Well, next time. Next time. So anyway, uh, as for the episodes that have covered the Manresa Castle, I could not find the episode to save my life for Haunted History. I know it's season two, episode three, but I couldn't find any sites that were. If M can't find it, for then me. it's probably not there. <laughs> Even the illegal ways, my friends. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I did find My Ghost Story, which is season three, episode six. And the ghost story was that a couple was sleeping there and they felt this huge cold blast of air. They could feel someone staring at them. They even took a picture in the pitch black being like, what the hell is going on? And they got a very distinct shadow figure sitting next to them. Ugh. Uh, and then the next morning, the wife is showering and she felt her back burning while she was in the shower. And when she gets out, there are three massive scratches down her entire back, like I from shoulder that. blade to hip bone. Hate it. 
Uh, they go downstairs for breakfast, and when they come back up to the room to pack up, it, apparently the room feels like a freezer, Ugh. and they believe that what happened was a spirit almost went through them because when they walked through the door, they felt something hit them and the wife immediately got lightheaded. She felt dread and she had to run to the bathroom to get sick. <gasps> oh God. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about G A Z B. Yes. And this is season 14, episode three. And this was a pretty good one. Uh, this is during just like the mid interview walkthrough, a door opens by itself and they stop the interview to ask the spirit to open the door again. And it does on camera. Yikes. Yikes. They did an EVP session and got the phrase help her on tape, which oh. apparently is one of the common sayings yeah. people hear. In the kitchen, someone lifted a pitcher of orange juice and slammed it on the counter. Like a oh random God. something lifted up the pitcher and slammed it on the counter. And apparently when the staff are washing dishes in the restaurant, they will feel something holding their hands under the water. Ugh. It feels like another person holding their hand. Gross. Oh, uh, I thought you meant hold, like pushing their hands into the water, like holding no, so, them there. Like holding, holding, holding them down their hand. And holding it down so they oh, can't get Oh, and holding Oh, okay, okay, okay. It's I all see. bad. All, all the bad it's things. It's all holding it in every possible bad way. Okay. Um, one of my favorite quotes of the episode is Zach Bagan saying... I haven't taunted in a long time, <laughs> but I will taunt. God, okay. a long time since what? Two weeks ago? What do you mean a long time? <laughs> then uh, he's talking to the <laughs> housekeeper who got punched in the face. And he's saying, like, can you punch me as hard as it punched you? And she's like, I can't punch that hard, which is I feel so bad for her. That's awful. Um, so the door opened on its own. Zach tells uh Zach tells the spirits to make sounds in the room it wants them to go to. And then you hear two loud bangs in the basement. <laughs> no, thanks. Great. So Zach starts taunting the spirit as he does. And he told it to punch Aaron in the face. He is such a dick. They see a child staring at them from under the stairs. Huh? They see Gross. it? Forget they, it. They see it. I didn't see it, but they <sighs> say they see it. Uh, and they also got the sounds of a little girl giggling and saying hi to them on tape, like on an EVP. Yuck. Yucko. They then hear uh, loud footsteps pacing the hallway above them, which is uh, canon. <laughs> and so uh, then they hear very loud sounds of plastic crinkling or a tarp being stepped on. Ew, that's weird. It's, uh, it's so weird. I, that one I don't have an explanation for, but... huh uh then they feel something really cold and when they ask is there something you want us to know they got an evp saying something is here <laughs> yeah we know that yeah, thank that you much we know thanks they asked what is your name and with the spirit box they got the name natalie which could have been the little girl that they saw i guess <laughs> um that's the story that they were going with at least uh could this be yeah, the yeah, little yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Technically, I guess it could be, but it's like, okay. It's like it's likely and also not likely. It's all also at the same very time. not. Yeah. <laughs> they also got EVPs that said "Get off the table, trouble, and enter." <sighs> when they asked, "What do you think of the guests that come in here all the time?" the spirit box said, "Stay out." Okay, that I can understand. Fair enough. Pretty and clear. And when and when Aaron gets the response, uh. When Aaron gets that response of stay out, he says, whoa. And then the spirit box mockingly said, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love when they mock them back, you know. Yeah. They also hear tapping and knocking on a table by the bed. And the phone starts ringing in the room that Aaron is in by himself. But nobody's in the hotel. Good night. So the, the fucking phone just started ringing on its own. That's Absolutely gross. not. And Zach was just trying to order room service and got the wrong <laughs> number. <laughs> he was like, have you gotten punched in the face yet? <laughs> <laughs> and that's Manresa Castle. I love it. And just on cue that now that my window's open, I hear the local church bell tolling. It adds a very creepy factor Oy. to it. Yeah. What's the weather there? Um, it's very lovely. It's been like uh, 75 and sunny. Um Nice. We had some rain last night. You know, Ooh. it was, it's been a, a nice, this fucking gong is going real long. I don't hear it to be clear. It's 2 11 p.m. I know I've complained about this before. What are they gonging about? Like, <laughs> it's not like it's on the hour. 2 11. I don't, 2 11. 
I don't know. Is there like an in memoriam situation to oh, eleven? Well, that would make me feel bad. I have no idea. Oh, maybe oh. it's the queen. I don't know. Do we? Do does is the United it, States? Does Kentucky give a shit about the funeral? I have no idea. I don't. Uh, that's today. <laughs> oh, maybe it is something about that. I don't I'm know. Not sure. I feel Whatever. like that would be really a stretch, but you know. All How right. silly. Okay, what a mystery that we don't care to unravel. <laughs> that I'm just going to ignore. Um, and hopefully you all can ignore and it's not too loud. So, Em, I've got kind of a short one for you today. Although today I was in the kitchen and Blaze made a noise and I went, what? And he said, I'm listening to the episode that just came out and you and Em said, we both have really short stories today. And he's like, this oh. episode is over two hours long. We don't know like, how to control. <laughs> to be fair, I came into this episode knowing my story was going to be longer because you said yours was short. So Yes, I know. I we tried kind to of even always, it out. Yeah, we even it out by saying, oh, are, they're short. Let's just tangent as much as possible. And it just ends up being long anyway. So he should know that by now. But I do have a shorty here. Um, and this is a story about the Alexander family slash the Lorber cult. Mm. And I... I guess a lot of people have, oh, well, not a lot, but several people have requested this story, but there's like barely any information out there about it. So, uh, especially uh, English information. So, there is some German hmm. information out there, um, but it's very shocking, honestly disturbing, and something that I can't believe I've never heard about. Uh, there's not even a Wikipedia article about this. That's how little there Whoa. is on the internet. So yeah. no wonder it's short. You probably had like a, a link. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a few links and uh, Medium wrote an article that was uh, it, basically the title I think is hands down the creepiest family cult ever. Um, and there's a few uh, YouTube videos and I do have photos for you of the, these people. It. I want to warn you, this gets, it, it's, it's disturbing. It's short, but it's disturbing. So, Let's get into it. Uh, the Lorber Society was a relatively small religious sect of about 100 members. And uh, how it was created is there was this man in the 1800s named Jacob Lorber, and he felt influenced to write some teachings by a voice in his head that he claimed was Jesus Christ. Mm. So starting off strong. Uh, recipe for a cult, I would say. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> so Jacob, or Jacob, if you're speaking in the German, wrote over 25 books following this voice in his head. And over the decades, these books were inherited from one man to the next who believed in the teachings and followed the book's teachings. And oh. apparently the voice spoke through new people until there were over 40 volumes of this Lorber scripture. And the books themselves were published in the early 1900s. And in the 20s, the scripture's followers officially formed a sect called the New Jerusalem Society. Uh, under Nazi rule, after Austria was annexed, they were temporarily suppressed. But they, uh, post-World War II, they reformed as the Lorber Society or the Lorber Gesellschaft in Germany. Snaps to you. Thank you so much. Uh, a core belief was divine and free love. Uh, members felt this is where, uh, <laughs> this is when I hear this and I go, how have they gotten like hundreds of people to follow this? But I guess there's weirder shit out there. Basically what they believe is that Satan existed in the world and commits evil acts through people, but only through people who are not in this Lorber cult, of course, like Satan huh. doesn't touch them. Okay. And so okay. everyone outside of the Lorber Society was under control of the devil and their souls were lost to Satan already. Uh, and one day God would appear on earth and destroy anyone who would not see the truth and give up Satan. And only fellow Lorber member members were safe and trustworthy and like exempt from destruction. <laughs> okay. Is there, do you know, I don't know why I'm at no, ask how, away. Why? How does someone then become saved if they're already lost to Satan? And they don't, you know. It's just you're either you're born into this and lucky. I guess or, so. Okay. I guess maybe if you join the cult, you can be saved. But like they're kind of saying, well, you know, there's billions of people out there, and they're all kind of a lost cause. Uh, Jeez. There's only a hundred of us. Oh, okay. So, so wow. they're so, the special chosen ones. So starting really quickly into the world of narcissism, of we're better than everybody else. I guess why did I ask? How did people believe this? Of course they believed it. They're <laughs> like, oh, I'm special, and God loves me more than everyone else. Well, I'm in. Sign you know? me up. Yeah. Sign me up. So. 
Not only that, but Lorber followers had to adhere to very strict religious lifestyles. Um, Every single day was centered around prayer and worship. And in the mid-1900s, a professor in California began translating the works from German into English. And this is when the teachings kind of moved uh, more outward. So more people had access now that they were in English. So uh, this is where it gets just so fucked up. I'm like... Very you quickly, wow. You, yeah, like four you, minutes in. Four minutes in. You think like, oh, well, it's like a fucked up cult and the, the, it kind of dies out. No. Okay. Just okay. Ready. So there was this couple, uh, Harold and Dagmar, and, you know. <laughs> Take it away, cl- Dag. Classic German couple. I actually have an aunt named that. Um, oh, is Dagmar a female name? Yes. Oh. Well, what's so, a female name? But it sounded... Uh, yeah. I, it it's sounded traditionally dog, yeah, masculine. Dogma. Right? Uh, Harold and Dogma sounds like it's spelled like Dagmar. Uh, Alexander, that was their last name, were a married couple. They were living in Dresden, Dresden, Germany, in the fifties, and they were members of the Lorber Society. Harold was extremely close with the then current leader, whose name was George Riele. So when George passed away in the 50s, Harold was kind of next up to take over this cult as the leader. He took the throne um, and there it didn't seem to be like an official ceremony or anything. He just kind of stepped into the role and now he was the boss. Okay. So along with the leadership position, Harold also inherited a harmonium. <laughs> What is that? It's a portable, thank you for asking, it's a portable organ slash accordion that you can kind of take with you and play music on. Okay. And so he would use this to accompany religious gatherings, like to play music as they were doing their, you know, rituals and prayer, etc. But more importantly, Harold had a big announcement, uh, which I assume he said over the chords of the harmonium as he sang to his people. What did he say? He said the next prophet would soon arrive. Oh, shit. And everyone had to follow this prophet. And was Dagmar pregnant or something? Is that what? Oh, boy, she was. You're Uh onto something here. How mysterious, (laughs) Em. It's almost as if I can see right through it. (laughs) It's almost as if this pattern has repeated itself over and over again. Uh, so conveniently, Dagmar was pregnant with their second child, who was an infant son named Frank. And how convenient that he, what are the odds, turned out to be the next prophet. Also, imagine being the firstborn, being like, what? Well, it was a girl, so I don't think oh, she stood a chance. I um, see. But now imagine we... you're like a five-year-old and you have to listen to your newborn uh, brother. Oh, um, it gets worse. Like, it gets that times 10,000. Like, <gasps> to a disturbing degree. Oh, that, God. Okay. Uh, I'm already dreading telling you about. So this little Frank, he's born, um, and from that moment on, all Lorber followers were to consider Frank's every word as the word of God himself. What? Uh, Anything Frank ever said or commanded was the utmost truth, was the divine law. This is an infant, so he's probably saying, like, baba and, like, poop, making making sounds, and they're like, this is a divine truth. Like, no one questioned, like, maybe we should give it, like... 10 years wait till he's a little bit older i mean i understand i do understand in the chaos of it them probably thinking like oh well whatever the the baby says is just uh is is god working through them or some bullshit like that but like uh, you like everyone has been a baby like you yeah been... like they're still constrained to like uh you know not being able to vocalize words like, <laughs> like no one thought a like baby. no one thought oh this baby's not gonna be able to tell us like what god wants from us for at least a few years yeah no they just were like wow this is our new prophet we gotta like trust Fucking everything crazy. that happens okay. uh here so this child frank he had been born in it's conflicting sources either 1954 or 1953 um, and Frank had an older sister named Marina, who was clearly not cut out to be the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and he had two younger sisters who were twins, Sabina and Petra. And they were also expected to follow Frank's every command, as was his mother. Gross. Yeah. 
So Frank grew up in this, I mean, imagine how toxic this is, in this role where he was glorified by everyone around him from the literal day he was born. Uh, and Talk about, like, raising a narcissist. Like, yes, I mean, you're literally telling him he's the voice of God from the moment he's set foot on Earth. It's, it's recipe for trouble. So he did have a stutter, um, and it's believed he saw a psychologist for this, but there's not really much information on that. But aside from that... A little hiccup in their plan, I guess. He was the divine prophet of God and everything he wanted, he got. And wouldn't you know it, this takes an extremely dark and disturbing turn. I I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) You, you, You figured it out. I did know that, yeah. Well, as a teenager, Frank got curious about sex. But here's the problem. People outside of the Lorber Society, I don't know if you remember, but they're all controlled by Satan. And he couldn't have sex with... Ah people outside of the uh, Lorber cult or religious sect. So, uh, because this would be unholy. So in the late 60s, when he was a teenager, Frank decreed that the holy and pure option was incest. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, to be clear, I'm not for this. But I do want to say, like, I'm not surprised that a teenage brain who thinks he's a literal God and wants to like explore his sexuality. Like, I'm not surprised that he just made it. So like, however that his, he needed to. his, his religious quote unquote upbringing is like, you can't sleep with people outside of the cult. And it's like, well, and he was like, well, I'll fix that. Like if yeah, every, what's it, the n- next option. I, I, yeah, I, I, it's, it's sick, but also like in a, in a teenage brain who's been told everything you say is true and we have yeah. to listen to it and has been given no fucking discipline in his entire life. Like, I'm not surprised that's where we ended. That's where the brain Very, goes. Yeah. Not and shocked. of course, his father is like, okay, sure. That Ugh. makes sense. You know, I oh, mean, God. oh, oh, it's bad. He said his three sisters and his own mother would have to satisfy his sexual desires. Oh, my God. And because they were, you know, raised in this way and treated in this way, they all obeyed and said, OK, if that's what he, he says, that's what that's what's true. Even the, the even his mother, a grown woman who's yep. like and she wasn't like born into this world was she like she has you know, some they were experience. both in it together when they were married um so i don't know if she was raised in it or not it seems like she may have been um okay. at least they were in it from early days uh, i was gonna say she doesn't have any like prior experience before all this the like parents don't sl- okay well what I, I, whatever just can keep going oh this isn't just your normal parent child relationship this is a god on you're earth right. you're right you're right you're i right. mean you're there's right. just no logic and even the entire Lorber society was like, okay, we are not going to question it. If that's what you say, you know? Wow. But of course, people on the outside pretty quickly noticed something was up. Um, The Lorber society ended up subject to an official police investigation. So the Alexander family stepped back from the Lorber society and they relocated to an Island, uh, one of the Canary islands, uh, Tenerife and relocated to Santa Cruz Hmm. Uh, in Spain, Frank's fanaticism surrounding the women in his life, AKA his family members only got worse. He started to believe that women were inherently evil, which I think is something we all saw coming as far Mm -hmm. as like, Oh, you're raised. The women in your life are raised to obey every word you say, even the ones who are older than you. Of course, like that naturally leads to like, well, there's something wrong with them, you know? (sighs) And so he, decided that special rituals were necessary to make sure women could enter heaven. And the rituals involved death. What now? They, so they have to be killed to go to heaven? Correct. As like, so, that they, so that a man can basically help them along their way and escort them in some way? You know, I don't way. even know if there was that much logic. I think he just decided he wanted to... Kill women. Yeah. Precisely. I can't um, believe there's not more information about this I online. I know. What? That's what I'm saying. It's like, what the fuck? How can you, uh, you Google this and it's like hard to find stuff on it. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe someone just like scrubbed the internet to be like, well, this is too bad. Know. I don't know. So obviously he's like, well, you can't enter heaven alive. So I'm going to have to perform <laughs> a ritual to send you there. You know, uh-huh. uh, he Frank out. Sorry. He outlined this process, this ritual, as the killing process, uh, which all women in the family would have to undergo at some point to save their souls. And basically, he said, this will happen whenever I decide it's time. 
So I now dictate when people die. Yes. So now he, I mean, so now he's also playing executioner. Oh, yeah, he's God. Remember, he can decide mm-hmm. when people die, I guess. Wow. Um, in the meantime, the Alexanders lived a pretty unassuming life in Spain, and their neighbors kind of didn't know anything about them. Uh, they kept to themselves. Frank was working as a delivery boy. Harold was known to play his harmonium day and night. Uh-huh. <laughs> and in December of 1970, so at this point, Frank would be either 17 or 16 or 17. Is that right? 53 or 54 to 70. Yeah. So either 16 or 17. He's sitting in bed. And he and his mother's there and he suddenly takes issue with the way she's looking at him. And he decides there's something <sighs> demonic in her eyes. And he realized that the killing hour was upon them. Oh, my God. So he tells Dagmar, his mother, that it was time for her to die. And she said, OK. I mean, it's like so deeply disturbing. And I just want to warn everyone again. This gets pretty graphic and horrific. So. You know, we're already there. It's already graphic and horrific, but here we go. (sighs) She laid herself face down on the bed to make killing her easier. Oh, so it's like Uh, right now, like time to go. Just this this very moment as you look at me. And this is not a joke. Harold started playing the harmonium. (gasps) That's so creepy. So creepy. Can you imagine if you were, sorry, speaking of like hauntings, like that's the kind of fucking music where I'm like, that would be the kind of thing you'd think would play at a haunted house, like that creepy organ music, mm-hmm. you know? So he's playing the fucking harmonium and reciting psalms as his son literally kills his wife in front of him, his own mother. So he starts to put her to death with a wooden coat hanger and is just like beating. <gasps> what? Yeah. And of course it gets worse because of course it has to. Frank's sisters, Marina and Petra, were also at home. And according to Frank and Harold, they also submitted themselves to Frank's will, waited until Frank was finished beating their mother for him to beat them into unconsciousness. So after beating them, Frank stabbed them multiple times to make sure they were dead. Then he and Harold used garden shears and razor blades to mutilate all three bodies. This is where it gets even darker or or at least more graphic it's already as dark as it can get, I think, but it's this is where it gets more graphic, just a warning. Okay. Frank and Harold cut out Dagmar's heart, wrap it in cord, and hang it on a wall. They also cut out... I'm sorry, your face is like, <laughs> like pure and utter shock, and I'm just, like, I feel so bad. Just, I feel like I'm like throwing you into a wind tunnel, and you just like can't I even d- breathe. You're just don't getting, know what's like, happened. I don't, I don't know what comes next. Okay. <sighs> they also cut off pieces of her genitals along with some of the women's nipples, and nailed them to the wall. (gasps) And apparently, the whole time, uh, Frank is just, like, instructing his father on how this works and is saying, oh, this is all part of the killing process, how they get into heaven. Like, at this point, this is just, like, a delusional teenager making this shit up and saying, oh. And I I know that he... I know that the dad is, like, submitting to him and thinking, like, okay, well, this is how they get into heaven. Doesn't he... You could still feel sad, right? Like, he didn't feel bad or upset? No, or... I think they were just, like... Oh, they did feel sad. Actually, you know what? I take that back. Uh, that We get to a point soon where you can see they do feel, like, sad, but they felt like, oh, but this had to be done, you know? like That's wild. So there's that's... a sick twistedness of, like, oh, this is just how it goes, you know? Um, wow. So <sighs> they genuinely d- determined that this was part of their ritual process i don't know who believed what clearly the father harold was believing this at, to some extent because he went along with it and then the two of them sang danced and destroyed all the material goods in the house uh that linked them to earth that was the next thing they had to do but they also uh included passports among those objects interesting uh, incidentally this thwarted their future plan to escape back to germany because they destroyed their own passports as part of this well, that's process. what happens when, like, a 15-year-old is in charge of the plans, I guess. Seriously. Jeez. Seriously. Like, what are you cu- cutting your passport up? It's part of the ritual? Whatever. Mm. So that night, the two men slept out of their home on another property they owned. And meanwhile, 
there's still one of the daughters not home because there were the twins and then the older <gasps> daughter. So one oh, of yeah. the twins was at work while this was all going on. Oh, and so she comes home to this fucking not brutal quite. massacre? Okay. Not quite. So she's at work. She's working as a housemaid for a well-respected local doctor named Walter Trankler. And she's 15 years old. She's working in the kitchen when her father, Harold, and her brother, Frank, knock on the doctor's door. The doctor opens the door and finds both men covered in what he thought was mud and dirt. Spoiler alert, it's not. Uh Uh, They introduce themselves as Sabina's family members and ask to speak with her. Uh, Walter let them into the house but thought something seemed off so he pulled a classic move and eavesdropped on their conversation from the other room sure as you should especially in this scenario Uh, he hears Frank and Harold tell Sabina that her sisters and mother were dead because Frank had decided the killing hour was at hand and it was time to cleanse and release the souls of his mother Dagmar who by the way was 42 and his sisters Marina 18 and Petra 15 now walter is listening to this like horrified around the corner he doesn't know any of this uh and he hears sabina start comforting her father and brother and she takes her dad's hand presses it to her cheek and tells them i'm sure you have done what you think is necessary i mean she's been brainwashed into this whole idea of like oh her brother is the hand of god you know yeah, but imagine being Walter, being like, yeah, what he, the he fuck? He's like, this is, I thought I would be hearing, like, you know, some juicy gossip, gossip yeah. not, like, the crime of the century. So according to Walter, the trio then hugged each other lovingly and, like, comforted one another because, like, you had mentioned they were sad, but they thought this was what they had to do. Mm. And so he just stood there in total terror. And now there's two sources or two different stories that sources say happen next. Some say Walter barricaded himself in another room and called the police. Sure. Understandable. Another source says that he politely asked the Alexanders to step out on the patio for a moment (laughs) <laughs> and then while they were out there, he called the police himself. It's like, be a doll. Would you mind? Be a doll. <laughs> Step outside for a moment. Either way, when the Spanish police arrived, the Alexanders were still there, uh, carrying on like nothing was wrong. Uh, of course, it turned out that it wasn't mud on Frank and Harold. It was blood. Oh. Uh, but they still sat there talking to Sabina, business as usual. And they were acting so casual that the police actually thought this was a mistake and they went to the wrong house or they, they were like this, there must be some, Walter must have misheard Ugh. because they're just so chill and acting like nothing is wrong. Wow. So they asked Harold, uh, the police asked Harold what was going on and he tells them everything. He says, Oh, well my son is the voice of God. And he said that the killing hour was at hand. So he, you know, murdered my wife and my two daughters. Uh, he even told the, home address for the police to go see where the killings had taken place not like a tinge of regret or like dawning of understanding here i wonder like what their process was when it comes to talking to the police because i know that the police are like or anyone that's not in their circle is they're not in the like they but they wouldn't understand so i wonder if you if they thought like oh because they wouldn't understand just spare them and lie but i guess not I know that's what my thought is too because you like you hear about these cults where they're like oh well they would never understand so I've got to protect myself from the law Mm -hmm. even though I know what I did was right like I agree I I found this very surprising how just casual and nonchalant they were about this they even gave the home address and sent the police there that's Um, really bizarre bizarre it's very bizarre I totally agree. Uh, There was not one attempt to, like, cover up the crime or any of the bodies. In fact, it was, like, much more gruesome than anything the police had ever seen. Boy. I was going to say, I wonder if it was, if they never felt like they needed to hide it from the police. Because maybe the the, the guy, the the boy, what's his name? Jacob? Uh, Frank. Frank. Why did I think Jacob? Um, Maybe he, like, was thinking I'll... You know, he either wanted a pat on the back because he thought, well, of course they're going to know I'm a god. Or maybe sure. he thought, like, I'll convert them. Like, maybe they just need to see with their own yeah. eyes. I mean, I you're right. Know. Like, he's still a t- he's still 16 years old. Like, maybe he just has some delusion about... I mean, they like, 16-year-olds, like, love a good bout of shock value, right? True. So, like, maybe he thought, like, this will really blow him away and I'm Especially the best. Especially if he genuinely believes he's the voice of god like you're right maybe he just thought like oh well they'll know they'll understand they'll believe yeah. me Boy. 
So they send them to this crime scene, and apparently the Tenerife police had never encountered something so horrible or gruesome. It was very shocking, um, obviously. And astonishingly, neither Frank nor Harold were convicted uh, of this crime because after extensive interviews and evaluations, the court found them both unfit to stand trial. I Okay. I can see where that would come in. Uh, yeah. Doctors believe that Harold suffered from a personal inherent mental illness and that he'd induced it in Frank when he raised him. Uh, one Spanish article called Frank's alleged disorder a, quote, psychic contagion spread to him from Harold. Wow. Um, and again, this is like 1970. So obviously this is 50 some years ago as far as like understanding mental health. Uh, right. Yeah. A psychic illness. contagion. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like quite a term. Um, but so the court declared both men perpetrators not responsible and had them transferred to the penitentiary psychiatric assistance center in 1972 where they would be held and treated permanently. So essentially right. for the rest of their lives. However, in 1990, Frank and Harold escaped. Escaped? Yes. <sighs> dun, I want. Dun, dun. I feel like. How old would he have been when he escaped, Frank? The early 1990s, so he would have been in his 40s. Oh, wait, the son would be in his 40s? Yeah, he was born in 53. Okay. So okay, uh, I'm not good at math. So no, no, you're right. Forties, yeah. Um, late thirties, mm. early forties. Okay, because in my mind I was like, oh wow, he's still sixteen. How on earth did he come up with a fucking prison escape plan? But, no, yeah, they've been there for like it. twenty years. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. So we don't know exactly what year, but yeah, early nineties. So either late thirties, early forties for him. Sure. Um, and Frank and Harold just escaped, and I don't know. This is where it starts to just kind of disintegrate into history because interpol was uh brought on for this and they filed an arrest warrant for them but nobody ever found either of them and if they are still alive which uh frank very well could be i mean he would be what 70 in his mm -hmm. 70s born yeah. in 53 or 54 yeah um if they are still alive uh which is possible uh, you know then they're still at large and nobody has ever caught these guys Wow. I, it's just, it's just wow. Just shocking. And I, then the story just died. I wonder when he was inside, if he learned anything. Because I feel like being, you don't get to keep acting as God yeah. in prison for 20, 30 years. Like someone's going to. That's a great point. Like knock do you some sense into you. Right. Like, do you think that you, that he would have changed his mind? Like maybe he was put on medications. Like we don't even know what treatment was given to him. Like maybe like, he has to know something to have been able to escape in the nineties and then spend the next 30 years, like not out. causing a, a big kerfuffle. You exactly. Know? And like you assume they would have changed their ways from telling the police everything they did to us i'm assuming change their names and avoid interpol somehow so mm -hmm. clearly they've been doing that successfully for decades yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost like they must have had some sort of shift but then again in, like i guess they were already like able to control 100 people and no true. one knew so maybe there's another small town that's currently being completely <laughs> controlled by this guy well, I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting point because there are rumors that they somehow made it back to germany to rejoin the rest of their lorber society oh. uh, and they they the rumors are that the lorber society harbored them as fugitives but there's not really any evidence this is all just rumor um mm -hmm. you know legend uh which i mean then i can understand how they were able to be hidden because if there's they have 100 people like working mm -hmm. together to like hide their identities then sure but there's no you know proof of this or confirmation um you know it'd be interesting though imagine them the lorber society over there taking them in and then this guy is like oh my people hi i'm your god and they're like what we have not been operating under that assumption <laughs> yeah they're like wait we thought that was over we thought we there was another we god hang Ooh, on awkward yeah. we, we didn't know we were supposed to be doing that um, what a weird uh having to reconcile with like oh the lorber society it here doesn't actually <laughs> know I'm on. God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. Well, as for Sabina, because she survived, and that must have been a very, I mean, obviously, very traumatic, tragic, mm -hmm. like, end to what you knew as your life. I mean, your whole family was 
destroyed, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and so she was sent, of course, to a convent uh, because she was 15 and her family was murdered. So she was sent to a convent. Oof. And from then on, we have zero paper trail. She disappeared from the media, from the records. Nobody knows what her life led to after that. I wonder if it was because she, like, same thing with them, but I wonder if it was because she actually wanted to go quiet or it was advised for her to go quiet or if she doesn't really understand i don't know yeah well and i know that um typically i believe at least if you join um a convent as a nun you know you adopt a new name so you're like sister so and so so you know maybe they just changed her name and then the paperwork didn't yeah we know she got sent there maybe that's when her old identity kind of faded away um and also i imagine you'd want to I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It depends on if she still believed it or not. But I imagine if you were kind of shaken out of that belief system, you'd probably want to avoid your brother and your dad. Yeah, after I guess that. so. Or, I, yeah, I wonder. I mean, that's a big leap to go from one religion. So yeah, true. Bl- with such blind faith to then just become a freaking nun. Like, and that's be a, like, oh, no, that's not God. That was your sick brother. Uh, yeah. Like you must yeah. have you must do all sorts of mental gymnastics to mm-hmm. to reach that point. Um, And so, like we said, shockingly, this is a very underreported and little known case. Um, It seems like it just got lost to time, which is so alarming because I feel like we hear much less Mm -hmm. bananas stories that somehow persist through time. But this one just kind of vanished. I mean, think about the studies you could do on this case alone for like how to like the the abuse, like the manipulation and the, the guilt that comes like, I, I, I don't know enough about the psychology or the, the neuro workings of a, how to get someone into a cult. But, like, I feel like we really glossed over that. And not because you didn't try your best, but, like, I feel like yeah. there's not a lot of information it, on how it not. got this way. Yeah. And, you know, I tried to, like, do more digging and I found um, information on, I think, probably the reason you said Jacob is because that was the guy at the beginning who wrote those his name mm. was Jacob Lorber. And so he's the one who right. kind of started this whole thing as far as like saying Jesus Christ was speaking to him. And there is a Wikipedia article about him. It mentions none of this. And I'm like, don't you think that's relevant that like, oh my God, this happened as like part the, of this society? The cause and effect of what you're researching right now. <laughs> and it literally, there's a section in Wikipedia called criticism. And I was like, here we go. Nothing. <gasps> I'm like, it says criticism. Oh, he said it was Jesus Christ and people take issue with that. And it's like, well, sure, wow. but what about, like, all the incest and murder? But no, not that? Okay, sure. Um, and I'm about to send you, and unfortunately, Eva as well, even though she's not here and she doesn't know what's happening, um, this oh, picture. This is Frank and Harold. All right, LOL. We'll explain later, Eva. And Frank is on the left. Um, you can see his very alarming eyes. Those are then, some alarming eyes. Wow. Uh, aren't they? And then there's his dad uh, to the right. The dad has some Charles Manson vibes. He does, doesn't he? I actually had that exact same thought. Um, And here's, I'm actually going to send you one more photo. It's just a different angle. But uh, for whatever reason, you can see that Frank is still making that same horrible face with his eyes. Like bugging out his eyes. Like, that's what I'm saying about, like, if this... uh, What a a case to forget about. And, And, oh, hang on, someone's calling me. Is it the Interpol? They're like, stop sending these photos. Um, No, but I mean, in terms of like using this case as a study, like I would love to be able to know if Frank was going to be a fully functioning human being or like just looking at his eyes and the way he's kind of poised. I'm like, like, did just being told you're a God your whole life to do this? Or like... Were you How already much of this was... predisposed to like some sort of mental illness? Like because that, like... May, I mean, again, like maybe it does go off of um, what the newspaper was saying in its many words, but like maybe his father was really mentally ill, and then you know mm-hmm. either genetically or just as far as socializing goes, he passed this mental illness to his son. Like who knows? I mean, maybe they were both already ill, and then this just kind of set it off into a very terrible direction. It's like, like or it's, this is just like fully nurture and not or it's nature. Just and nurture. like, yeah, I don't maybe know. that's like some, maybe that's like an, an, some sort of alpha pose. He thinks like kind of is like some menacing. Like he's, yeah. I don't know. I'm sending, um, I know this is sad, but I feel like it's worth sharing. It's a picture of, um, the sisters. Dagmar. Yeah. And then the sisters. 
um, Dagmar Petra and Marina. Just like very, very, very sad. I um, can't so we'll have that's... Megan put these on Instagram just if anyone needs wants to see the face we're thinking of or talking about because it's yeah very unsettling. Um, Oof! Wow! Yuck! So anyway, that's the story. It's like one of those where I said, "What's that?" and then I said, "How on earth have I never heard of this?" It's a, it's it's pretty incredible. I feel like this in the is one of those ways. that I see a TikTok on, and they're like. The creepiest cult you've never heard of. Maybe I'll make yeah. that TikTok later. I'll be like, okay, <laughs> before TikTok does it for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before your algorithm already knows you just yeah, did all this it research. Yeah, probably does. It's it's like M's is just like calories a cool word, and mine's like here's this incest cult. I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send it to you. There was a because there really are some names on there that <laughs> really actually when you take away its meaning, you're like, oh, that is a, a good flowing sound. And uh, then you're yeah, like, yeah, I believe it. I do. Yeah, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, cool, man. Well, that's a terrible. Oh, wait, you're supposed to. Say, and that's why we drink. Oh, God, I forgot about our cool new thing that works really smoothly it's every time. So stupid. Anyway, and that's why we drink, folks. Blah, 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 blah. That was not even well done. Um, Christine, are, do you have anything planned for us for our after chats this well, week? Well, all I had was just those same questions and stuff because we only, of course, got to four out of the like 600. But did you have anything <laughs> planned? <laughs> no, I just okay. liked your questions last okay, time. Okay, great. Well, I have some more fun ones for us. Um, so we can do that in the after chat. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, life's good. <sighs> life's good. We've got two shows this week. We've got, we're seeing each other. I'm very excited Yay. to see you. Um, what else? And I feel like that's that's why it. We drink, and that's why we drink. And oh, we're doing that now. Sure, I, I don't we were... know. Oh my god, I I tried to say oh, and other than that, life's good. And you were supposed to say, and that's why we drink, and it didn't uh-huh. happen. And you it said, will... yep, life's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here I'll do it. Okay. Man, life is good, and that's why we drink. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>